Join us in the call to worship. We need grace alone. May we reform our hearts. We need grace alone. May we reform our church. May, May we, we always, always be reforming. reforming. Generous God, your grace is sufficient for all my needs, yet still I try to do it or get it all on my own. Help me to trust in your grace alone, not my works. I pray as you first taught. Our, Our Father, Father, who art, art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture is from Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 through 14. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods, gods for us, who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to, to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and all of, of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. Hi, everybody. I got this from Pastor Amy for being so awesome during all this COVID stuff. She's helped me do so much with sun school and Bible school. I just thought I should show a little appreciation. You know, I'm just so excited to give this to her. I know she's going to love it. I worked really hard in making this and getting it together. I am just ecstatic for it. Oh, shh. I'm sorry. It's all right. I'll but I, it I have I this. Got to find some paper and. I have this for you. Oh. I made this for you. Awesome! Thank because you. Because you have been so awesome during all this COVID stuff and helped me through so much. I made you this certificate. <laughs> that is perfect. Oh my gosh! Thank I, you. That is so I wonderful. Thank you for saving the day. 
I did. worked really hard on this. Oh my gosh, I that's said, so great. I worked. Oh, so full, amazing that you were full. on this because I was looking for just the right paper for this. Um, and this is heavy and. Oh, wow. But you're folding the certificate. Yeah, this is just what I needed. I can't believe you knew. I don't know how you knew I needed this. Uh, but you I, just always seem to know the I, right things to bring in when I need something, Melanie. So that's really awesome. I appreciate that. Oh, goodness. Okay, so here's what I had to do today. Yeah? It was super important that... Um, that I make this airplane because I have somebody coming later and um, they're just really into airplanes and I knew that I needed to take care of this today and I couldn't find the right paper to fold but, but look that, at this beauty Good. thank you so much you're we're welcome that's the certificate I gave you that's for wrong. being that's that I made that that for was just you. what I needed But I, I worked hard so you could s put that up and see it and know how awesome you are. But watch it go. Watch. Yeah, it did go away. That quite wasn't what I thought you'd do with it, but. Oh, what's the matter? Well, I made that especially for you. And you turned it into a paper airplane for someone else I'm sorry you know this reminds me of a story from the Bible see there were some people that were slaves in Egypt and God set them free and when they left Egypt God said take the jewelry from the Egyptians and that's going to be my the sign of my promise to you because I set you free. And so they took the, the jewelry. The Egyptians gave them their jewelry because God said to. And they left. And do you know what happened? They got to, they got free. They went through the Red Sea. They came to the mountain and they had to wait for Moses to make Ten Commandments. And while they were waiting... They lost their faith. And so they took all of their jewelry. You know the jewelry that, that showed. That was proof that God did something awesome for them. And they melted it down. And made an idol. Cool. That wasn't good. And an idol is a God that's not real. No. And so they took the sign of what God did for them. Something really awesome and special that God gave them. And they, they made it into something fake and not as good. Hmm. Kind of like a paper airplane made out of a really, really cool certificate. I'm sorry, Mel. You worked really hard on that. And I was so excited. And I, I was thinking so much about, about one thing that I forgot to appreciate how wonderful you are. That's okay. I'm, I'm glad you could take care of what you were worried about though. Yeah, and you know what else makes me glad? This is still a really beautiful certificate and look at all those cool folds. <laughs> it looks like a yeah. shell now. Yeah, it does. And it will fit just right in my picture frame that I have just for this. So thank you so much for getting me the certificate to fill my new frame. Awesome. The gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, look, I have prepared my dinner. 
my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready come to the wedding banquet but they made light of it and went away one to his farm another to his business while the rest seized his slaves mistreated them and killed them the king was enraged he sent his troops destroyed those murderers and burned his city then he said to his slaves the wedding is ready but those invited were not worthy go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found both good and bad so the wedding hall was filled with guests but when the king came in to see the guests he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I am so glad you're with us today and so glad that we can share today and I can feel you with us, even if you're not in this room and, and as grace would have it, you wouldn't be able to fit into this little room with me anyway. So, so, um, even though we're virtual, what a joy to feel you with me here today and to, to know that, that God's grace gets us through this situation and to know that grace is our topic for today. We've been going through the, the different tenets of of the Reformation and as we have today we come upon the topic of grace and grace is so essential to who we are as United Methodists we have a very unique perspective of grace and our own um, distinct theology of grace which does separate us from other denominations so I think it's important for us to talk about this today and to talk about this idea of being saved by grace alone and that nothing we do is ever going to be enough to, to make uh, up for the other things that we do and that it is grace that saves us and that there is a response that comes with grace. So we begin today in that reading we had from Exodus chapter 32. Now, to understand this really and fully as a passage of grace, you have to know um, something about an earlier passage in Exodus. Sometimes that's the way these stories go. We, we pull scripture out and read a chunk of it, but sometimes if we don't remember what happened before, if we, if we only read that little piece, we miss where it, where it sits in the, its context. But here's the context of Exodus 32. The Israelites have escaped slavery in Egypt. And when they left slavery in Egypt, God said, um, take the jewelry from the Egyptians that you're leaving and it will be a sign of what I did for you today. So as the Egyptians um, say goodbye to the Israelites, the Israelites are given by the Egyptians, they don't steal it, they're given the gold, the earrings, the, the bracelets, the, the signs of freedom. And that at that time was a sign of freedom was, you know, kind of like, um, Harry Potter when Dobie gets a sock and that means he's free. The sign of freedom was, was this, um, this gift of something valuable that the Egyptians give as they send the Israelites on their way to say, yes, I really did mean it you are free. So they give them gold. And that's the sign of this amazing gift God gives of freedom. And in Exodus 32, Moses was taking a long time to come down from the mountain. And so we are losing faith 
in the God that just saved us. We're, we're so impatient that even though we've just been saved and Moses has only been gone a couple days, we can't handle it. And so it doesn't say where it came from in this passage, but we know Aaron says, take all the gold rings from your ears and bring them to me. All of the gold that was given to them by the Egyptians is now going to be used to make an idol, to worship that's not even a God, not even real, made out of the very symbol that God gave us for our freedom. So talk about slapping God in the face. The Israelites are not just disobedient in this passage. They're taking the very thing that God gave them as their gift to show their freedom, to show what God's done for them, that very thing, and using that to create a different idol to worship than God. But God still forgives them. God still says, you're still going to be my people. Now, there, there might be some work involved with you later. There might be some other things you're going to have to work through because I see you're not ready yet. But you are still my people. I still claim you. I still know you and call you by name. And because I know you, I will give you grace. You did not earn it. Those Israelites didn't earn a scrap of grace at that mountain when they took what God gave them and melted it away, all because they were too impatient to wait for, for Moses to come back down from the mountain. Calm down your fierce anger, God. And God did. Moses reminds God and, and tells God, you know what? Remember the promise you made a long time ago? This, this would ruin that if you don't save these Israelites. Remember how you loved us when you did this, when you did this, when you did this. That promise... I trust it is still there, even though people have been disobedient. And so God gives grace, grace to the Israelites, grace to us. The story from Matthew is the story of God giving grace to us when, when we really, um, we, we really aren't worthy. The ones who were invited to this wedding feast, the ones who should have known better, they weren't ready. And they decided not to show up. I think that's, it's one thing when we go and, and then we, we, uh, we don't step in. Or when we show up, but maybe we don't have our robe on. That comes later. But, but to just decide right from the start, we know this is a big deal. But we're not going to be bothered, God. That's the first people in the, in the reading. And then there's this other group of people who are all invited from every walk of life. And they show up. And they get to join the party. And they get to celebrate and be honored guests. But then some of the honored guests decide to not do their best. They decide that even though they're being honored, they're going to disrespect the host. And um, those guests are not, are not shown a lot of grace and forgiveness in there. Because what 
what we're looking for is as people, what God is looking for, what all, all beings are looking for is to be respected and cared about and loved. I think that's one of our most important values as United Methodists. And one of the reasons why we try so hard in so many ways, sometimes I'll, we don't get everybody on board with it, but we try so hard to make sure that everyone is loved and cared for and respected in the United Methodist Church. Um, and that's where we get some of our struggles for with, you know, are our, our women always respected the way they should be? We need to work on that. Are, are people who make different choices about their lifestyle always respected and cared for? That's something we need to work on and we need to strive for this because that is one of the ideals that's coming to us from this, this passage of Matthew 22. Everyone wants to be respected as the host. We need to respect God. We need to respect each other. Um, and these, these Israelites, you know, they come to the wedding feast, but they don't wear their robes. And that's where we are. They made it to the mountain. They followed Moses, some of them happily and some begrudgingly but they did follow Moses there. And now that they're there, that, that little bit of effort that they need to put forward so that they can continue in their faith, they're not willing to do. At the end of Matthew 22, we see weeping and gnashing of teeth. At the end of Exodus 32, we see grace. There's always hope and room for grace. Grace is truly and always efficacious to the reformer. So that means that grace is almost irresistible. Some denominations would say irresistible. And we get some things like predestination out of that, where people really feel like, um, their whole path has already been determined. God already decided who's in and who's out. Uh, and we can't resist grace if it's presented. Therefore, if we're the ones who are supposed to be saved, we will find grace. We will find Christ. And, and if we're not supposed to be saved, well, then bad things will just happen to us. And, and we're just going to die and we're going to go to that really warm place. And... <laughs> And that's just meant to be. That's irresistible grace. And we don't believe in irresistible grace. We believe in prevenient grace. Now, this is where that United Methodist theology jumps in at us. And maybe I'll run over a little today because I really want you to understand where we are as Methodists. Um, but United Methodist theology is so much different than, than what was there before in a few places. And this is one of those ways. We don't believe in empty grace like the church pre-Reformation. I'm not going to put this on the Roman Catholics. We were all in that group at one point in time. And then the Reformation started kind of splitting people apart as far as denominations. So, so to say that it's the Roman Catholics that, that had it wrong would be incorrect. It was all of us who had it wrong. Um, but before the Reformation, grace was just one of those things that happened and um, you weren't saved by it. It was just a nice thing God did for you, but you still had to, you had to do work to be saved. It was all about works righteousness in many ways. And um, we have, even before that, long since declared works righteousness as heresy. Nothing we do is ever going to be good enough to make up for our sin. And therefore, thinking that we can work and do things in order to make it into heaven is not, is not correct. Only by the grace of God can that door be opened. 
And God chooses to do that for us. God chose to do that for the Israelites who, you know, days before had had received a sign of their freedom and then in in frustration and impatience decided to chuck it all and make it make an idol. God had grace for that. God has grace for us and it is a free gift offered to us without a cost. Offered through sacrament and and special means of grace but also common means of grace as well like prayer and just being. God offers us grace. Um, but in, in the Methodist way of looking at the world, grace is resistible. We choose to respond or not to respond to grace. In Wesley's world, for example, there were a lot of, um, you know, mostly the church was made up of wealthy people who were business owners and and um, important people in the community. And those people were taking advantage of others. And as they were taking advantage of other people in the community, they, they would manipulate them with religion. And that was one of the problems pre-Reformation. But since the Church of England didn't come through Reformation, it only caught glimpses of that Reformation theology and Reformation faith. And so um, there were still some issues in that Anglican church regarding, um, regarding who could be there and who deserved the grace that God had. And one of Wesley's founding principles of Methodism He didn't want to start a new religion. He wanted to start a movement within the Anglican church where people realized that God was not just for some, but that God's grace was a free and generous gift to everyone. And through that, Wesley developed the theology of prevenient grace. It is the grace that God gives us before we even know God's giving us grace. So infants can receive prevenient grace and um, adults can receive prevenient grace and, and people who, who have jobs that are shameful can receive prevenient grace and people who, who hurt other people, like all of us, can receive God's grace, even if we don't go to church, even if we're not um, allowed in church because of our status, God can still be our God. We can be children like Rahab, who even though we don't know that God, we can be faithful and we can respond to the grace that we're given. So in in Wesleyan theology, there is a grace that goes before even um, our knowledge and understanding of God. And that is prevenient grace. And it helps us in those spaces where we are not ready to accept God, but where we can clearly see later when we look back that God accepts us, even if we don't accept God. Even if we, like those Israelites, burn, melt down the the gold from our ears, God still loves and cares for us. Now, That's prevenient grace. But Wesley goes further and says, you know what? We are not judged based on whether or not we are perfect or have done the right things or um, based on whether or not we have sinned certain sins instead of other sins. We are judged based on how we respond to whatever grace God gives us. So when we receive grace when we need it, and God's grace is always sufficient for us, we are always receiving grace from God, whether we know it or not, when we receive this prevenient grace from God. How we respond is how God decides whether or not we are ready for the wedding banquet. That's how God can tell if our robes are on. Prevenient grace is our invitation, putting our robe on, 
is our response. If we accept the invitation to, to receive the grace and respond to it, whatever that looks like in, a, in the most faithful way we can, then God invites us to the feast. There are these, there are so many theological terms that are painful, but, but there's, there's a monergism and synergism. And monergism says that it's only God that saves and not what we do. And that was a, a rally cry of the Reformation. Monergism, monergism, monergism. Synergism says that the sinner has to cooperate or God can't save that person. In Methodism, we, we don't really have either one. How can that be? Well, let me explain. We believe that God alone can save and that it's not up to us to decide who's in and who's out. But we also believe that we need to respond to grace and that that's, that's our call as as humans, as Christians, as, as people created in God's image. And that, that is synergism, the idea that, that we need to respond to grace. But how do we need to respond? Do we need to respond by coming to the first invitation? Do we need to respond by having the right robes in our closet ready to go? Or do we need to respond by doing the best we can whenever we can? Or do we respond by asking for forgiveness a lot? The answer in Methodism is we don't know what God's criteria are going to be. And we can't. Because sometimes we get a scripture that says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And other times we get a scripture that says the Lord changed his mind and fulfilled his promises to the people. God gives us prevenient grace. We choose whether or not to respond. God judges us based on how we choose to respond. But we cannot decide what that looks like. And so early Methodists um, sought and, and Wesley encouraged them to seek out Christian perfection. That doesn't mean we do everything perfectly. That means we love each other as perfectly as possible and we love God as perfectly as possible. That's Christian perfection, doing our best to love God and each other um, with the means that we have available to us. So the goal is to seek that Christian perfection so that whatever God's criteria happen to be, we might fall into it. It's not a guarantee. Nothing is a guarantee. But it is always hopeful and full of assurance. Knowing that God does keep promises, even when we turn our back. Knowing that we are all invited, even if, even if um, we don't uh, feel worthy. But also knowing we have to respond somehow to that grace. We have to somehow at least put on our best clothes for the wedding feast when it comes. Now, I hope that sheds a little bit of light on what grace alone looks like. And I know I went a little bit longer than usual today, but I hope it sheds a little light on what it means to be United Methodist and what it means for us to understand and accept what God does for us and balance that with, with our response, because both are very, very important as Christians. And I hope it also helps us see that we can't be the judge and we can't decide and we can't say this group is in or this person is in and this person is out and, and push people out of the church like the Church of England did in the days of John Wesley. Because there are so many people 
in our community and in our world who are just like us, confused sinners, hoping that somehow grace is for them. So may we preach that message of grace, grace alone, God's grace as the way we are saved. And may we share with this world that they always have a chance to respond. And if they act like the Israelites from time to time, well, we do too. But we always have a new grace to respond to every day. And may we respond the best way we can for as long as we can, in every way we can. And may God bless you all on that journey. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which passes all understanding, bless your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.